You want me to tell you about the time I smoked a cigar that had the horse fly in it? Huh? That's right. It wasn't until after... <laughs> well, I thought it was a pretty great cigar, you know, the holy smokes. My eyes were lighting up like pinball machine, you know? Oh, ta-ta-ta, ta-ta-ta-ta, Erasmus. This is the Salute to Vulgarity Hour. For those of you who are, well, you know, trying to make the scene, beginning to list heavily to port. Well, we're here for you, yes, indeed. We're, this program is especially designed to uh, be felicitous to that unsung group, that tiny minority that hardly ever gets anything handed to them, the soreheads. Uh, <laughs> uh, it's not easy being a sorehead, you know. Bad people, you know what I mean. But they, the guys that cause all of it. Let's hear a little more of that, please. Please don't go. We'll miss you. Please stay. No. Where don't you want me to go? Australia. All right, baby. All right, come on down, baby. George, it's getting so you have to brush them off like flies. George, <laughs> the James Bond of the airways. Get out of my way, baby. I'm on my way. Uh, come here, Don. Quick, quick. Get out of my way, baby. I'm on my way to Bangkok. <laughs> oh. Ding, a ding, a ding, ding. Jews are tonight. <laughs> Even Don smiled in there. <laughs> you know, uh, uh, this is not going to be a program tonight about the Jews. Of course, I'm feeling ten feet tall. I'm full of Chinese food. <sighs> My charge. Pickled bee's knees. I'm full of Chinese food. I've just come back from the happiness up on Broadway. We've had a giant fist fight with our listeners. Once again, proving that the myth is far greater than the man. And, uh, you know, I had a, a very strange experience tonight. And I wonder how many guys who were present tonight at the happiness. We had a little going away party. And for those of you who wonder why we're going away, well, that's my own business. There are times when a man has to keep things to himself. Right, Don? Oh, boy. And uh, <laughs> we are going to go. Uh, I'm using, of course, the editorial we, meaning me. Me and my flight bag. 
Uh, I am going to leave uh, this Sunday via a plane, and uh, I'm going to arrive at Frankfurt a couple of hours later. You know, the marvels of the jet age. And then from Frankfurt, I will take off in another aircraft on my way to Athens. Mysterious, romantic, ancient, decadent, smelly Athens. And uh, I'll, <laughs> I'll be in Athens for a while. And then, you know, I'll futz around and walk around and blow my nose and yell. And then I'll get back in the plane. And a few hours later, guess where I will be? <laughs> Kambala, Sambala, Cairo. I will be in Cairo for a moment. And then the plane takes off once again on its way to Mysterious Bangkok. I will be in Bangkok then. And uh, remember this, it's all of us in Bangkok. I'll be in Bangkok. And <laughs> I'll find out if what they say about Bangkok is true. And I'll report to you. If uh, what they say is true, is true. You always wondered, haven't you, Don? Well, I'm going to find out. And then I will leave Bangkok and go to Singapore. Sinister, mysterious Singapore that plays such a strong role in the great dramas of the sea. Written by Joseph Conrad. The mysterious, decadent waterfront. Where the British cannons all pointed the wrong direction when the Japs snuck up from behind. <laughs> what a fiasco. It was one of the great fiascos in history. And then I'll fool around in Singapore. And then I will leave Singapore. And the next moment I will be in the ancient kingdom or the ancient land of India. I will be in Karachi, New Delhi. And then finally, after dining sumptuously on sacred cow, I will land at Darwin. Darwin, named after Charles Darwin. This is where Darwin sailed around, and, and uh, what was the name of his boat? No, it was not the Pequod, and it was not the Bounty. No, it was not the USS United States. Yes, that's right, that's right, the pinwheel, you're right. Yeah, I remember that, it was the pinwheel, the HMS pinwheel. Yeah, I remember the captain. What was the name of the captain? The captain was somebody named Hornblower, Horatio Hornblower. Uh, <laughs> the, the, uh, the famous cruise of the... What's the name of that famous ship? Crap, what I read about it. Come on, what is it? The Pindar? No, that's not the name of it. Crying out loud. <laughs> well, anyway, that that uh, that's I'll be in Darwin, which I understand is a. Incidentally, you know, Darwin was bombed during the war, wasn't it? Japanese laid a couple of eggs right on her there, and then uh, I will get back in a plane and I will be on my way to Sydney, and then I will go all over Australia. I'm going to go out back. I've made arrangements, Don, uh, for those of you who love to travel. And I, on a, to me, traveling is the. It's the nay plus ultra of life. It is the, it is, uh, it, it is it. Uh, I am, um, the roses come to my cheeks the minute I settle down. It, of course, of course. The HMS Flegel, I remember that. Sure, Hiram Flegel it was named after. The HMS Flegel, you're right. And, uh, I, <laughs> and then I, I made arrangements to get, to get my hands on a private plane in Sydney, and I'm going to fly all over uh, Australia as much as I can in the time I'll be there, which would be about, uh, oh, ten days. And I'm going to go out back. I'm going to fly all the way back into the wilderness, Don. Back there where they tell me the kangaroos are so thick that uh, they have to buzz the ground about five times with their airplanes to clear them out before they can even land. You know, this is a... Uh, and I'm going to go back into the sheep country. I'm going to go out on the Great Barrier Reef. I'm going to fish for sharks. Uh, they they have the greatest, uh, I, I understand, some of the greatest deep sea fishing in the world off that barrier reef there. Uh, I'm going to uh, make the whole scene there, you know, in Australia. I'm going to find out what they say. Uh, you, you know, you've heard what they say about Australia. I'm going to find out if what they say about Australia is true. And I'm going to report it to you. <laughs> A lot of things they say. Well, for one thing, they say that the water, when you're letting the water out after you wash your hair, you know, the dirty water in a sink, that it revolves a different way than it does here. You know, I'm going to watch that. I'm going to make very sure that that's... So yes, I know. Don't call up anymore, friends. We understand now that Darwin's boat was the HMS Flegel. And uh, we, we know that, and I remember it very clearly now from biology, too. It's the HMS Flegel. 
It was named after the, the no, it was named after a famous German marine biologist named Heinrich Flegel. And uh, we'll get into that later on when we get into our further discussions later on in the graduate course. And then I'm going to leave. Now, now here's what I'm going to do. I'm taking with me, Don. I'm taking with me my Ewer tape recorder. I have a beautiful little tape recorder. And uh, I'm going to I'm going to record sounds, not interviews. You know, I'm not going to walk around and say, how do you, how do you like being a uh, native of Bangkok, friend? Uh, nothing like that. I'm just going to record sounds. Because to me, one of the most fascinating parts of going to other countries, one of the most interesting things uh, is, the, is the way different countries sound. They really do sound differently from each other. Uh, the sound of America is very different, for example, uh, say from the sound of Holland. How do you think Holland sounds? Just, you know, walking around the streets at 2 o'clock in the morning, opening your window and listening. It doesn't sound like America. Uh, when I was uh, doing the Beatle piece uh, in Playboy here a few months ago, I was I was particularly fascinated by by the sounds of Scotland at two o'clock in the morning, forever and ever and ever. Scotland now to me, the sound of Scotland will be the sound of old steam locomotives coming through the hills with that peculiar English Scottish whistle. You know that. You know that crazy whistle they've got? And you And there is a kind of wonderful uh, dark blue golden quality to the sounds of the night in Edinburgh and throughout most of Scotland. And I will always associate it with the sound of boats. Uh, you can hear ships. Uh, one night in, in Dundee, for example, I could hear, I could hear the sound of buoys. Uh, and they have a special kind of buoy that doesn't sound like the ones in Maine. Uh, buoys and the sound of, 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 of water, the sound of the, of the harbor there in Dundee. And it sort of uh, fits in and, and makes the, all the sounds uh, distinctive and real there in Dundee. Well, you know, we could go on. And I'm going to take the tape recorder and I'm going to record sounds. I'm going to record the sound of how it sounds in Bangkok. Now, I'm not just saying street sounds. Uh, have you wondered how it sounds at 2 o'clock in the morning in Bangkok? What you hear? Well, you know, that's an awfully hot country, and I'll guarantee you'll hear a lot. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to uh, put the old microphone out the window, turn the gain up, and just record the sounds of a Bangkok night. I'm not talking about night spots or night clumps, just the way it sounds, an ordinary sound. And I'll record sounds in Germany. I'll record sounds in Athens. I'm going to record sounds in Singapore. And uh, you can hear how all these different places sound. And, and, and I intend to have them on the air as soon as I get back. And, uh, <laughs> uh, oh, you know, I, I'm really, really beginning to get excited. Uh, and for those of you, here's what I'd like to I'd like to do another mysterious thing. For those of you who are willing to go along with a gag, here's what I'd like to do. Are you willing to go along with a gag? Uh, m uh, not many people are, but, but if you are willing to go along with a gag, I'm going on this plane. Now, it's an ordinary plane, see? And it's not uh, any special plane. There's not going to be any big shots or anything on it. I'm, I'm leaving from uh, Idlewild Airport. I'm leaving uh, Sunday. I'm leaving Sunday night. It's going to be a flight that takes off on Easter night. Or, or that's Easter Eve, isn't it? Yeah, Sunday night. Now, uh, <laughs> these people, you know, they're just ordinary people. They're taking a flight to Germany. They don't know what's going to go on. I would love to have about... About 50 people show up, you know. <laughs> people show, uh, show up to see me off with big signs saying, Shame! How long? Or it's about time! You know, that kind of stuff. Big old wild scene. <laughs> and I'll not say anything. I'll wear black glasses and I'll wear my coat up around my collar. And I'll hurry aboard the plane and I will sit back in the back there, you know, and I'll, I'll scrunch up against the window and say nothing. And from that moment on, the entire passenger crowd will think that there is a sinister gangster aboard. <laughs> Somebody's been kicked out, and nobody, of course, will ask. They'll say, say, yes, sir, would you please tell me who you were? And I want a lot of people, oh, Excelsior, Excelsior, shame, shame, how long, how long? <laughs> uh, all right, and, and I don't know exactly what time the plane is leaving Sunday, so if you want to come out and be part of that little gag, I will tell what time. I don't know now, so I'll, I'll make mention of when the plane leaves on a, you know, what time it's going, and it will be Sunday night. And uh, I will talk about it tomorrow night. I will know tomorrow night exactly what time the plane is uh, is going. Uh, speaking of uh, fiascos, this is WOR AM and FM New Yorkie. And would you uh, please uh, 
press the practical joke button there, Donald, if you will. Yeah, it doesn't matter. Just, just hit it. Oh, yes. Now, speaking of practical jokes. Oh, boy. Once you try Miller High Life beer, it's your beer for life, friends. It's a great beer with an honest-to-goodness premium flavor. Miller High Life has a tradition of brewing excellence that originated in European castles centuries ago, a tradition that has continued in America for 110 years and has made Miller High Life famous the world over as the champagne a bottle beer. So the next time you serve guests at home or have an evening out at your favorite bar or restaurant or honky-tonk, enjoy life with sparkling, flavorful, distinctive Miller High Life. Miller High Life is brewed to absolute perfection only in Milwaukee and enjoyed in all 50 states and in more than 50 foreign countries. So no wonder it's a long-term favorite of millions. Miller High Life. Please check me a little bit there. Miller High Life, the champagne of bottle beer. Music to film. I'll fill it. Razzmatazz. Very good. That was a heck of a great commercial. Speaking of magnificent commercials, Don, please, the practical show. Light up a Kent, you've got a good thing going. Good taste, real, real mild. Good tobacco. Oh, so mellow. Vintage tobaccos, flavor blended to the peak of enjoyment, and the Kent filter for extra good taste. Light up a Kent, you've got a good thing going. Kent is the one cigarette for everyone who smokes. Light up a Kent, you've got a good thing going. Light up a Kent, for real good taste. Light up a Kent, you've got a good thing going. Good tobaccos, the Kent filter for good taste. Going when you light up a Kent. A good thing going when you light up a Kent, light up a Kent. Bum ba da do, rasma tansin and oti toot. Bum ba da do, da da dee. Light up a da, da 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 da. La da da dee. Da 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 da. Look, please do not call any longer. I did not ask for telephone calls, friends. We know very well that the name of Charles Darwin's famous boat, it's, you know, it's, it's as famous as the Bounty. It's the HMS Heinrich Flegel, which, uh, gee, what a terrible cigar. Well, well <laughs> boy, this is one of those exploding kind. I took the bomb out of it. They're not going to get me, boy. I tell you. But, uh... I'm very excited about this trip, and uh, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm champing at the bit. If you notice, I'm beginning to uh, work into it now. I don't. Whenever I'm get, getting ready for a trip, you know, I work. Oh, for the benefit of those of you who might wonder, the show will continue on. Uh, we will be on the air all the while we're in. We've been uh, recording special shows. Uh, John Gambling has recorded a whole series of shows for us. They're John Gambling Memorial Time Signal and Weather Report shows. So uh, you can be uh, assured that there's going to be an exciting time here on. <coughs> oh, that's the car. What, what is it? A joke? What kind of stuff is this? Terrible cheap butts. Well, uh, uh, we tonight. Uh, I guess the reason I'm uh, feeling in such a such an odd, quixotic mood is that I had a very peculiar experience tonight. Strange experience. And only only an ex-GI, I guess, could appreciate such an experience as I had tonight. Very odd one. Uh, perhaps you haven't heard, but the last couple of nights we've talked about a little party that we were going to have, a kind of a little going-away party. We had a great time there tonight. I wonder if any of you were there or listening. But we really had a ball there. It was at the little restaurant called The Happiness, just The Happiness, a great Chinese restaurant up on Broadway between 90... 3rd and 92nd, 92nd, 93rd, or is it 93rd, 94th? Yeah, right up in that area there. And they have a gigantic sign hanging out over. It's a beautiful, it's a whoopee sign. It's one of the few neon signs that I've seen in a long time that was literally a happy neon sign. You know the kind of paintings that Don Kingman does? Do any of you know Don Kingman's work? Well, Kingman does these beautiful 
oriental, strange fantasy watercolors. He's an old friend of mine, and, and he and I used to go painting and drawing a lot together. I just saw Dong here a couple of days ago. And Dong Kingman has a way, he loves signs. He loves street signs. And one day we were down, way downtown, doing a, doing a drawing. I was doing a drawing, and Dong was doing a drawing. And I was, I was watching Dong work. And, and Dong took the street. We were both working on it. And suddenly Dong began to draw into the street a whole series of, of wild, uh, fiesta kind of banner-like signs, just signs hanging in the street, until the street became one great cacophony of color and signs. It was just a big splashes of color. They weren't there. He, he created them there, you see. Uh, and this sign that hangs outside of the happiness, just called happiness, uh, is one of those signs. It's a Chinese sign. And it has a, a big Chinese symbols, big Chinese. I don't know what it says. I hate to ask them. <laughs> it's not to say something great, you know. Uh, there's the two big Chinese symbols hanging out there. And, and it really is a very live-looking place down there. Well, we, we went in and had a party there tonight. And it was, a, it was kind of an odd party. The whole place was filled with listeners and people. And we sat around and had Chinese hors d'oeuvres. And, and uh, oh, one of my favorite things is this is sea bass broiled in uh, bean curd. Bean curd and soy sauce. Oh, boy. And uh, we sat there and, and uh, talked. And I finally got up on a chair. And, and uh, we had a question and answer period. went on for about an hour and a half. And somebody in the crowd asked about some of the people who I have talked about on my show. Guys like Schwartz and Broner. Guys like Flake asked where they were and so on. And somebody jumped up and says, where is Gasser? How about Gasser? You ever hear from Gasser anymore? I said, no. Gasser's out in California. Never hear from Gasser anymore. And uh, then someone says, well, do any of the people who ever heard, who ever uh, played a part in your show, do, your mother, your aunt, or anybody, do they ever hear the show? Do they know about this? And I said, no, they don't. As a matter of fact, a couple of months ago, I sat in my mother's living room, and there was my aunt, my aunt Teresa. <laughs> You've heard me talk about Aunt Teresa, the nutty aunt. There was Aunt Teresa, as nutty as ever. She, before the evening was out, she got mad and went home. Aunt Teresa was there. Uh, they were all there. Aunt Clara and Aunt Glenn, the whole crowd were there. And they didn't know it. And I finally had to say it. I said, you know, you know, Aunt Teresa, if I announced, Aunt Teresa, that you were going to make a personal appearance on the corner of 47th and Madison Avenue, <laughs> there would be 50 people there just to, just to see if there really was an Aunt Teresa. She said, what do you mean? Very suspicious. What do you mean? I said, well, nothing, Aunt Teresa. I just, you know, I'm doing this little radio show and once in a while. I thought, what, what do you mean by that? What do they want to see me for? I said, well, Aunt Teresa, look, look, Auntie, it's just that, well, <laughs> you can't tell her, you know, they just want to hear her her girdle thwang, you know. She wears one of these real tight girdles. I don't, you know, what, what am I going to say, Aunt Teresa? Nobody's come to see Aunt Teresa. She doesn't have a fan club. And she got very suspicious, and for the rest of the evening she sat there and she kept saying, Jeannie, what do you mean? What, uh, I've never been to New York. None of those people know me. I said, yes, they do, Aunt Teresa. And how they know you better, Aunt Teresa, than you would ever suspect they know you, baby. What do you mean? Well, that was the way that they went. Well, the guy tonight in, in The Happiness got up and he says, Do any of the people who ever have been part of your show, or do they ever hear the show? Do they know? I said, No. Uh, most of them are in the Midwest. Some of them are way out in the far west. And that's about the end of it. Well, after we finished, I was on my way out. When all of a sudden, right in the middle of the crowd, I'm going through, and most of the people have left, a guy got up, and he stuck his hand out, and I looked him in the face, and it, it was like a thunderclap. This guy was not only the hero of one of my stories. <laughs> this guy was a strange kind of nemesis throughout a large part of my army life, and here he was, sitting in the happiness. He sticks his hand out, and he says, Roswell T. Edwards. I said, Roswell T. Edwards. And here he was sitting there, and I had not seen Roswell T. Edwards until one day, till the day, that, that infamous day. Do you remember the story I told last night, Don? You remember the story last night, Don, about the, about the code? He was one of the guys in the code group. Roswell T. Edwards. Well, I, I looked at old Ros, I said, Roswell T. Edwards, you have not changed a bit. You look exactly the way you looked then. And he looked at me, and he said, so do you except for the beard. He says, you look the same as you did then. I said, Roswell T. Edwards, holy smokes. What do you say to a guy, you know? And he says, gee, well, let's, let's get together. 
Well, I, I, I looked at Ross, and immediately the whole scene came back. Roswell T. Edwards was the epitome. I wish I could say the word on the radio. Any of you GIs, ex-GIs, tell whoever you're with what I mean. He was the epitome of chicken you-know-what. You know, there are officers who are this way. There are GI officers, you know, who have everything all sharp and clean and bright and their brass shines. There are, there are generals who are like that, second lieutenants by the millions. But you rarely run into a yardbird who buys it all the way. A genuine GI, spick and span, upright, flat gutted, bright eyed, uh, bushy tailed yardbird who, when they holler, Police up the area. He goes down on his knees like a like a nut, and he starts policing up the area. He polices up the area with a complete concentration, the maniacal concentration of a guy who has taken some kind of strange esoteric vow, that kind of guy, and makes it rotten for everybody else. Absolutely rotten. Because every time anything would happen, the, the, the lieutenant would get out in front, and here's our, our, our scrunchy bunch of Signal Corps soldiers, round-shouldered, near-sighted, round-bellied, uh, a, a whole bunch of ex-radio, amateur radio operators. You know the kind of crowd. Oh, the scruffy-looking mob are all standing there. Can hardly come to attention, you know, without falling over sideways. In the middle of it is Edwards. Magnificent. Boom, you know. You know, have you ever seen those, those, those great posters they have for recruiting, those wild-looking GIs that have their hair shaved up the back and their hats right on? He looked like a West Point cadet. And that son of a gun was a, was a Signal Corps PFC. I mean, he was way down at the bottom of the totem pole. And, and, and here would be our mob standing out there. And in the middle of it all, bang, like a, like a chunk of spring steel. Roswell T. Edwards. Well, <laughs> here he is tonight. You know, and and I'll, I remember one one wild moment, and and I almost I almost said, Edwards, do you remember this? Uh, do you remember this day, Edwards? And I, I did. I, I mentioned to it, and he sort of colored a little bit tonight. He says, yeah. Oh, wow, yeah, sure, I remember it. And then he straightened up. Did you notice how straight he was standing? Did you notice how flat his stomach was? Did you notice his bow tie was leveled off like he had done it with a spirit level? Well, he goes through life like that. He's probably, he probably irons his jockey shorts, you know, before he puts them on. Make sure that the crease in his socks is right, all that kind of stuff. Well, Roswell T. Edwards, one day, I remember, there was a little brewing mutiny. He was part of, a, of probably the closest I've ever seen a company come to a mutiny. Uh, we were at the University of Maryland. We had been shipped there. Uh, the, the whole organization was in terrible chaos. The war was going from bad to worse in Europe. And every day, guys were flunking out, out of, out of ASTP, and they were sending them directly into a foxhole. They didn't even put them in a boat. They shot them on a slingshot. Right out of the University of Maryland, boom, they'd go right into a foxhole somewhere just this side of Bastogne. So everybody's worried. Oh, boy, they're working like mad and saintly. And every Saturday morning, we had this GI completely involved inspection. And we were living in dormitories at the University of Maryland. Regular college dorms, and there were two of us to, to a room. And sleeping with me was big, fat old slob, old, old Goldberg, my old favorite roommate. I was with Goldberg all the way through the early days of my army. Big, fat guy who, <laughs> who was the kind of guy who wherever he went in the army, there was a whole crowd of clamoring relatives followed him around. <laughs> yeah, there was always his brother-in-law, some nut calling from the next camp. And they, there was always a whole crowd of people, wives and cousins and uncles. They just sort of followed him in a great crowd. Apparently, he was the king bee of that little that little mess, that sordid mess that he came out of. And where he went, they went. And uh, he would arrive, and uh, they, they'd have a room. And the next thing you know, that whole that whole mess has arrived. And, but he was my roommate, so old Goldberg. He was so fat, he was like Laurel. He was like Hardy of Laurel and Hardy, and and <laughs> you know, you know some other idea of a really fat GI. And he would lie on his bunk below me. We were two complete slovens, both of us. 
I am a sloven. My desk, you know what, what happened recently? To show you what kind of a sloven I am, we have these beautiful new offices they fixed up here. Well, I decided with the new office, I was going to turn over a new leaf. You know, I was going to go straight. I was going to straighten everything up and throw all the waste paper away and all the old hamburgers that I, I didn't eat from last week. I've got, do you know that I have got paper cups that have green mold in them from stuff that I did not drink out of them as as long ago as five years ago, the mold is now six and a half feet tall, and Bob Smith thinks I've got plants in my room. He comes in, he says, those are interesting looking plants. Actually, it's mold climbing up the wall. You know? <laughs> well, well, the other day, Jimmy McAleer, the program director, came in, he took one look at my desk, and he called Lee, Lee Brown, my, my producer, and he said, listen, either Shepard cleans up that desk, or I'm going to set fire to it. One or the other, because there's bugs coming out of it. <laughs> <laughs> so you can see the kind of room that Goldberg and I had. Goldberg incessantly smoked a pipe. Now, uh, you know, it's one thing to smoke a pipe, but he didn't smoke a pipe. He had a little briar sewer that he smoked. It wasn't really a pipe. I don't know where he got it, but it was a strange... And every time he would suck on it, it would go... <laughs> Ooh, boy. I mean, you th I was at the feeling the pipe was just about to throw up. You know, And he'd go... <laughs> And I, he'd be lying on his bunk, always below, because he couldn't climb up to the top bunk. I'm on the top bunk, scene, and Goldberg's on the bottom bunk. <laughs> and he'd be down there in his underwear, and, I, and, and it'd be dark, and I'd hear... And there'd be a slight pause, and... And the, and the tobacco he smoked, I'll tell you, I, I have heard stories about opium dens. I have heard stories about hashy smokers. I have heard stories about oriental hookah water pipe smokers. Wherever Gasser, or rather wherever Goldberg got this pipe tobacco, I do not know. But I tell you this, it was the only pipe tobacco that I've ever seen that when it floated, it made a purple-green luminous smoke. You could see it in the dark. This smoke was so purple and luminous, and it would float up around the ceiling. Of course, it rose. See, and it pushed the air down. It was, it was lighter than the air. It was like some kind of gas. It did not mix with the air, by the way, Don. It pushed the air down to where he was. And air I would be up there in that luminous purple cloud of that fantastic pipe tobacco. I never go. Oh, and we had a little room about the size of a closet. It was designed for one person. And they put two guys in it. You know? And there I am in, in this cloud. It was like I was flying in the jet stream up there. And this stuff would, would create... It, it created pictures. It created tiny fantasies in there. You could see, you could see little dream worlds and everything else going on in this purple smoke. And and he spoos out another stream of this junk. Well, whenever, whenever Goldberg and I, here's the way we would get ready for for uh, the big inspection. Which, by the way, they really made a big scene about. It was like West Point or something. You know, they made a big scene. So Goldberg and I would make each other's bed. We never slept in the bed. We realized that if we slept in the bed, we would have to make the bed. So <laughs> we would sleep on the top of our bed all through the week with our extra blanket. You know, we'd put our extra blanket, we'd sleep there, and then in the morning we'd roll up our blanket and sort of tighten it. You see, tighten the thing. But for Saturday, on Friday night, both Goldberg and I would remake our beds. Goldberg would take one end of my bed, and I'd take the other end. We'd whack it. All right, come on, come on. Now watch them corners. Come on, Goldberg. Hold. And then we'd go down and we'd make Goldberg's corners. And then we would take everything else, everything. It was all, all around, like hairbrushes, uh, cigar butts, Goldberg's pipes, that sewer he smoked, all that stuff. And we would just sweep it into a great big pile, and we would shovel it up. We just shovel it up with the with the dustbin. We all had a dustbin. I would shovel it up and put it into Goldberg's barracks bag. Blah 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 blah. We tie it up at the top and hang it, and just hope that nobody came along and hid it. His, you know, the old barracks bag would smell, and you'd feel it flubbing around and fighting and moving. And and whenever we would, whenever we would have uh, this this big inspection, there would be a tension that would grow. The tension would grow from about. Oh, nine o'clock on in the morning on a Saturday. We had a few classes, and then about eight, nine o'clock, everyone would get a little nervous. We're running around trying to clean our rooms, and at noon was the big inspection. So Goldberg, it was impossible for Goldberg to stand at attention. You cannot imagine Oliver Hardy standing at attention, can you? Can you imagine W. C. Fields snapping too? Well, Goldberg was a combination of W. C. Fields and Oliver Hardy. <laughs> 
So no matter what we did, the room always looked messed. Just because Goldberg was standing there, he was a mess. You know, he'd stand there and his hat was crooked all the time and his tie was crooked and all. And I'd say, Goldberg, at least pretend like you can pull your stomach and try to bend over a little bit and stick it out in the back. Try that. And he'd say, ooh, well, how's this? And of course, he'd be bending over, you know, this behind you sticking out in the back. I said, no, Goldberg, come on. Listen, stand behind me. I'll stand at attention. See? And they, maybe they won't notice you. Won't notice me. It's like a little motorcycle standing next to the Graf Zeppelin, you know. So, <laughs> won't notice me. So every every Saturday, about about ten minutes to twelve, you'd hear it down below. You'd hear them. We were up on the third floor. You'd hear it down below. A third stand ready for inspection. A third and then you. Boom, boom, boom. All the doors opening, blum, 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 ruffling guys running in from the john, blum, 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 and then silence. And the dreaded sound of the inspection party coming up floor by floor. You'd hear those feet going, they'd go into each room. Each time, the guy in the room would holler, you'd hear the belt snapping. And you'd hear the egos crumpling. You'd hear everybody nervously standing at attention. And this guy is walking up. Now, we had the nuttiest captain you ever saw in your life. He was a VMI captain. If you think if you think West Pointers are out of their mind, you ought to see these VMI nuts. So this guy is he's a southern guy. So he's he calling, hot, hot, hot. Ah, put the men on report. And he had a voice that would cut. He wanted everybody in the whole place to hear it every time a guy was in trouble. Hot. Two D match for Gold Worm and Williamson. Put them on report. Pull their pass. Then you do plum, 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 plum. Dead hut. A long silence. Then you'd hear. Put these two men down for one D merit. Put down Murphy for one D merit. And uh, they can have a pass this week. At ease. Clunk. Oh, gee, they're getting closer and closer. Well, about five minutes before inspection one day, when everybody had his place all ready, we're all, you know, everything is fine. Uh, we, we, we've, we've swept all of Goldberg's junk into the big pile. I always threatened to just set fire to it. You know, let's just burn it all up, Goldberg, and start over. We'd swept all the stuff in the pile. Everything is clean. We've, we're all standing there with our fresh shaves and our face are hurting, you know, because the water was cold. And, and we've got our belts all shined and our shoes are all shined. When all of a sudden, remember, we're waiting. The guy is already downstairs. He's inspecting the first floor. When all of a sudden, Gasser, who was Roswell T. Edwards' roommate right next to us, Gasser comes running in his eyes. Are, he says, you know what that son of a gun did now? <laughs> he lived with this, Edwards. Yeah? <laughs> it's terrible when a sloppy guy is living with a with a with a real GI type. You know, he comes. You know what that nut's doing? And Goldberg says, "What? He is polishing with a blitz cloth the doorknob, and he is polishing the light fixture." And Goldberg says, "No." I said, oh, no, the nut, what, what, no, holy smokes. And instantly, the, the word got up and down the entire floor, Roswell T. Edwards polished the doorknob with a blitz cloth. He not only that, he polished the light fixture up on a ceiling with a blitz cloth. In short, it, it, everybody else in the place was going to get gigged now. They hadn't even thought, the, it, he invented chicken. The army never even inspected the doorknob. They never even inspected the, the light fixture. This guy now started a whole bit. <laughs> and guess is sort of nut. He says, don't blame me. Don't blame me. It wasn't me. It was it was that nut. He says, don't blame me. Because it was his roommate. See, he was going to get blamed. He said, don't blame me. And he runs next door. He goes to Goldberg. Hey, Goldberg, you better shine your... Quick, quick, get out your blitz cloth. And you could hear the feet coming closer. Go, get out your blitz cloth. Quick, get, get out that doorknob. Quick, get your... Edwards, Edwards did it. Don't blame me. And instantly, the entire hall, the whole place, is filled with guys with blitz cloths, frantically cleaning the doorknobs, frantic and swearing. Oh, you never heard such swearing, yelling. Oh, I, I almost used the word there, swearing. It started with a bitch. I mean, I started with a bitch, swearing, yelling, hollering. Oh, you never heard such language. And then on top of it, they've got the doorknobs clean, and all of a sudden they look. Their hands are green. 
They got green hands. The entire upstairs has got green hands from the blitz cloth. And now, a boom, hip, 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 hip. We stood inspection. An entire floor of guys stood inspection with green hands. He went from room to room and gigged every last one of us, five, which meant no passes for the next three weeks. He gigged each one of us five demerits, and guess what room was the only room with clean little pinkies, with wonderful shined doorknobs, with beautiful shined light fixtures? Roswell T. Edwards. <laughs> well, I can tell you, old Ross, and, and the odd thing about him, Roswell was, in, an, in a nutty way, a very well-liked guy in the outfit. But he had this maniacal, insane hang-up. It was like Craig's wife. Have you ever heard that, that great play? It was like he had a hang-up to make everything shine. He had a hang-up to make everything stand in little lines and little orders. Like, we would go into class, and he would put his pencils in little rows. You know that kind of guy? And they're all the same size, all neatly all neatly sharpened, and he would sharpen them the same size. If he broke one, then he broke all three of them, all at once. Had to keep it all ordinary, you know? If he wore out one shoe, he wore out the other one. He just wore them both out at the same time. Everything was in the neat little rows. Roswell T. Edwards. And so tonight... I am standing in the happiness, and I'm talking to everybody, and I'm just about to leave. And the guy stands up, looks me in the eye, and says, Roswell T. Edwards from Worcester, Mass. Roswell T. Edwards. Do you know what I did when I left the happiness? Surreptitiously, I stole a glance at their doorknob. And I, I stole a little glance down at Roswell T. Edwards' silverware. And what do you think he had been doing? Do I have to tell you? We got a couple of commercials here. Let's get with them here. Let's see. We got TV Guide. TV Guide. This week, TV Guide covers the quiet man from Uncle, actor David McCollum. You don't want to miss TV Guide. Oh, boy, what an exciting issue. You don't want to miss TV Guide. On sale everywhere. On the cover of the new issue of TV Guide. The man from Uncle. Okay? And also, we have American Heritage. Get that buck. Send it in to American Heritage. Box 711. Great Neck, New York. American Heritage and get a copy of American Heritage, a representative copy. Magnificent magazine. Put her there. Roswell T. Edwards. I expected old Roswell to give me a look and say, uh, Roswell T. Edwards, uh, your tie's crooked. Straighten up your tie. Uh, by the way, your belt's in need of shining, Shep. Good to see you. Nothing's changed. You look the same as ever. Sloppy. 